All right, as promised, part two of the BS Report with Chad Ford, who was on the Subway Fresh Take Hotline. We taped this on Friday, June 25th, after the 2010 NBA Draft. Here we go. We left out one Celtic scenario, which has to be mentioned. I don't think it'll happen, but, um, you know, Jeff Schwartz is Paul Pierce's agent. He's already talked about possibly opting Tyson Chandler out. Yep. Which everybody thought was crazy because Tyson Chandler is going to make $12 million a share and his, his argument is, look, the economy and the whole landscape of this league might be changing. Mm-hmm. I don't know if there's going to be money out for him a year from now. Right. If I can get him a five year, $40 million deal or whatever, right. that might be better than just getting that $12 million up front. Well, Jeff Schwartz also represents Paul Pierce, and we already know that he's thinking that way with, with Chandler. Right. I do think it's conceivable that, that Pierce could opt out. So now if you have no Pierce, no Ray Allen, Rashid retiring, um, there's four guys under contract with this team plus the first round pick, so that makes them a free agent player. Now we don't know, you know, who knows. But I, I was talking about that last night. There's scenarios, yeah. albeit, albeit, albeit um, probably unlikely ones. Where, yeah. the, where the Celtics could be sitting with $20 million, that'd be $20 million under the cap, uh, going into free agency. Right. And uh, that, that obviously, you know, that probably would invigorate Danny in a whole other way. Um, I, I mean, I, I know he wants these guys back and really doesn't I, I want think to go they, through the rebuilding process again that was so painful in Boston. But I don't think this would be the same rebuilding process. I was talking to my dad about this because my dad was like, I'm not going through 2007 again. I'm like, Dad. You know, if we get a top free agent, you pair pair that guy with Rondo, who is now a top fifteen guy, and Perkins and Big Baby, um, and you know, three other guys that we sign, whatever we, what you get with a sign and trade for Ray Allen. Like, I, this is not going to be a twenty win team. This will be a team that uh, is a playoff team that might you know have a ten year ceiling instead of uh, a one year ceiling. I think they got one year left with the nucleus they have. And, and I, I actually like the draft. I actually think Avery Bradley at 19 is a is a value pick because if you put him on a different team in a different yeah. situation than Texas, uh, a lot of people don't know this, but he was the ESPNU ranked number one player out of high school, not John Wall. Yeah, and uh, I, I I think that I think they got it wrong. Uh, by the way, and we had John Wall number one from July 1st, but as, as far as NBA player goes, and I can't speak to the high school. Maybe Avery Bradley was a better high school player than John Wall. That's certainly defensible. They're, they're, they're ranking the guys based off of who they were in high school, not but the, who they're going to be in the pros. But the point is, though, he, he's you a big time talent. Yeah, he was in the elite group. He was with Cousins and Favors and John Wall and Bradley, and there was one other, and those were the top five guys coming out. And, Danny, Danny just has a way. I mean, you look at you look at some of the guys that he's been able to get get in the you know mid to late first round, early second round. He's had a few stinkers. Uh, we all remember Marcus Banks and uh, Jared Giddens. Uh, uh, Jared Giddens, but on par, every GM's had some stinkers. Uh, so yeah. on on par, Dan, I think Danny's one of the best drafting uh, GMs in the league. I think he knows what he's doing, knows what he likes, and, and with Avery Bradley. Uh, I, I think I, I think he there was nine. You, you described it right from six to nineteen. Yeah, he's sitting there at nineteen, and he he hits the last guy. And you know why? Because we won a four way coin flip <laughs> that easily could have been twenty three, and then we don't get him. A, and my dad has been bitching about this for thirty five years that we've never caught a coin flip break or like a could go one way or the other break in the draft. So this is the first time. Um, you know, the other thing with Danny, I, I agree with you. I think he's an awesome drafter. The thing that he's not good at is is uh, picking guys who are already on NBA teams. Like we saw last year again with Marquise Daniels. Indiana was couldn't have been more delighted to get rid of Marquise Daniels. Danny signed him and really thought that this guy was going to be able to guard Kobe Bryant in the finals. Um, that's though, where I think he, he's he missed out. Even he averaged 20 games a season his entire career. That's about yeah. how many, I mean, he's healthy. Yeah. The Celtics have not – the one thing – and this is something that I think Daryl Moore has been really good at and a couple other GMs, not to tout my friend Daryl, but th- there is an art to grabbing some of these D-League guys or guys who are floating around on other rosters. Even the Clippers landed a couple guys this way. Um, and I do think that is has to be part of the whole GM thingy. Um, we, quickly, I wanted to go back to Cousins for one second. I, I think the biggest upside team for him 
We mentioned two, but I think there was one that was bigger, as if Oklahoma City had been able to get him. How close do you think that was to possibly happening? I think they were aggressive. And, um, you know, they ended up with Paul Aldridge, your, your favorite player in the draft. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I mean, how big did your man crush grow over the Oklahoma City Thunder when they called out Cole Aldridge? Because, actually, I'll, I'll say this, Bill. I thought it was a validation for you. Because Thank you. I think the Thunder are playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers. I and couldn't they, agree more. And, Sam Presti makes me mad. He's too good. He, he's, he, he understands something that... That I think I think Daryl Morey, I think a few a few GMs get a, a Kevin Pritchard have their hands around pretty firmly. I think he's the best at it. And there's other GMs in the league that literally have no clue what's going on here. He understood that there's a game within the game, and the other game also has rules, and it's the collective bargaining agreement. And they're complicated, and they're nuanced, and there's loopholes. And this guy understands, and, and I have to give some credit, too. It's not just Sam Presti. They have one of the best underrated uh, assistant GMs in the league in Rich Cho, uh, who is a former player agent who's just an absolute brilliant uh, guy when it comes to understanding all these things. He doesn't get a lot of, a lot of face time, but he, he's really a brilliant guy. And you put those, those two together, and you look at the moves they make every year, how they're able to pick up assets, how they don't overspend on anybody, how they keep taking back uh, a team right when they're the most desperate. They take one of their players, but get a couple of future assets in return. And well, but you know, the funniest thing is, it, and the funniest thing is, it's not like they're the only team that has cap space and could do this. And right. yet they, like, they're not the only team that could have traded for Daquan Cook and the number 18 pick from Miami. But somehow they were the team that did it. Where are these other teams? Like, where were the Clippers during that? Instead of giving up a future number one to to draft Eric Bledsoe number eighteen, the future number the Eric Bledsoe the pick that Oklahoma City got, the Clippers just could have taken DeQuan Cook's contract and gotten the pick. How stupid are they? Uh, uh, yeah, how about this? How about the Washington Wizards, who could have done the same thing? Yeah. Uh, uh, to move up, to get they needed another pick in the first round. They have to pay seventeen million for Kirk Heinrich. Yeah. To get the seventh pick, seventeenth pick in the draft, or they could have uh, paid two point one million for Daquan Cook's deal and gotten the eighteenth pick in the draft, and, and probably had a trade exception to just absorb his contract. I don't know what these teams are doing. Like for instance, I have no idea what the Clippers are doing. I don't even know if they have a real GM that runs a team. I don't know who made the picks, but like, you know, you for them that. to be, for them to end up with Eric Bledsoe at number 18 because they had to give up a future number one when they could have just made the Miami trade and, and carried Daquan yeah. Cook for a year yeah. is one of the dumbest things of the summer. Uh, it, it is. I've been told that that future first rounder is heavily, heavily protected. Good. They didn't have to give it up. Uh, I, 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 I gotta say this though. I like the Clippers draft. Yeah, I did too. Because I thought Aminu is one of those guys, if we're talking about the 6 to 19 group, one of those guys that if he figures it out, could be a wild player in the league. And I thought one of the other guys who, if he figures it out, could be a wild player in the league is Eric Bledsoe. I my, love Bledsoe. My third guy, uh, and we'll, maybe we'll talk a little bit about Larry Bird, is Paul George. And uh, I thought this was interesting. Bird's strategy, along with the David Morway, for the last few years after our test stain is we're bringing a high-character guy, we're bringing in guys who um, play in you know, top programs. Uh, we're not going to take a lot of risk. We're not going to swing for the fences. We're going to try to hit uh, singles. And you know, maybe in the case of like a Roy Hibbert, if you get a starting center at 17, I'd call that like a double. Um, even though I don't think he's a superstar, that's a great value at that point in the draft. That's a good that's, pick. That's what they're going to do over and over and over again. We're not going to take any risk. We're not going to have any buffs. Um, but we, we're not going to have any superstars either. And I think Bird looked at the Pacers after the strategy for the last couple of years and said, we're stuck in mediocrity. We're sitting here at 10. Ed Davis is on the board. Luke Babbitt, who I think everybody thought they were going to take Luke Babbitt or Cole Aldridge or you know, just one of these classic, Xavier Henry, one of these Patrick Patterson, one of these classic safe picks. And he did something very uncharacteristic for the Pacers. He swung for the fences. He said Paul George, on talent, could be a top five player in this draft. He could bust. He could be Nick Young. Uh, he could be Joe Johnson, and well, we, we're going to swing for the fences. And they did it again with uh, they did it again with Lance Stevenson. And the very uncharacteristic Pacers move, very aggressive. If it pans out, those guys will really help the team. If it fails, it's probably the last nail in the coffin. 
I made fun of you because you complimented that single double strategy last year. And in my opinion, that's the last thing you want to do is, is try to go 41 and 41. I'm not, I'm fine with the upside strategy. I just think Henry has more upside than Paul George. I wrote that today and I guess we're, we'll see. I just, when you look at, uh, what Henry's status was going into college and how highly thought of a recruit he was and the team that he was on and the role that he played, um, and the success that he had there, and I think we can all agree that that was probably not an easy situation to come into, especially with 5'11", 240-pound Sharon Collins, you know, dominating the ball. Um, I think there's a chance he could be a lot better than we realize. Yeah, and, and, I, and I could, I'm a Kansas fan. I watch every game they play. And, yeah. and, and because of that, it paints me to a certain extent because whenever you're following your team, you know, know the players almost too well. Yeah, and they they frustrate you at times, and they don't always live up to potential. That's why you didn't like Aldridge. And and yeah, yeah, I mean it, it, it's in part it, it's in part of that. Actually, I think Aldridge. I'm more teasing you about Aldridge than anything else. I think he's I think he's a good pick. I think he's I think he's underrated. I don't think he's gonna be a superstar, but nobody's claiming he's gonna be. It's the right uh, spot for him. Eleven. Once we found out he was really six nine, I think yeah. eleven was the right spot. I that I think, six eleven and six would have been a good spot. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's good. It's a good pick for them, but. Henry Henry's problem is I don't think he's a he, he's a good athlete I don't think he's a bad athlete he's a good athlete he's not a super explosive athlete but he's got this NBA body but he does he does not attack um, the basket he wants just to shoot those jumpers and I just feel like there's such a wasted now maybe he'll figure that out but my experience in the NBA draft is that if guys don't have that that switch in their head to figure out I've got a bigger body than everybody else. I can just take this ball to the basket the way Tyreek Evans did and just plow through and, and score. If you don't figure that out in high school or even though you played one year in college, I'm not sure that suddenly that just turns on in your head in the NBA and you can do it. Paul George has every crazy, ridiculous tool um, that you could ask for with the exception of he coasts. I, I think he's going to be a bust, and this will be a fun one for us to go back and forth on on Twitter. I, Coast, bad team, second team all whack. I don't see it. Uh, I think he's a better on paper and workout guys than an actual basketball well, I, player. I, I'm, not, I'm not denying that he could be, I, he could be a, a bust. I don't think there's any... Well, what do you want to have our big... What, what should be our big Twitter argument then this year? Um, which, which guy do we disagree on the most violently? Uh, you know, Paul I, George I, would be a fun one. I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say this guy is a guaranteed all star. Uh, right. I, I mean, he could be on the. He could be Nick Young. Uh, I, I mean, he he has some of that in him. I, I don't know who who do we disagree about the most. Now, see, this is why I didn't want to do the draft debate last week because we. I hate the years when you and I agree on almost everybody. I, it's terrible. Yeah, it stinks. You know, I will say though. All right, Philly at number two. They get Turner. We can all agree. Very solid pick. I like Turner. But if I if I was running Philly, I would have tried to sw- swap picks with Khan and pick up some stuff. Mm-hmm. Because I think – don't you think Khan would have basically done anything to get to that number two slot? Pretty much. I, I, well, you saw them. They did. They gave away 16. Uh, yeah. And, and here's the thing. Teams overvalue those picks until draft night. Nobody could get these picks traded until draft night, until teams actually say, oh, we're at 16 and the best guy on the board is Luke Babbitt? Yeah. Oh, well, in that case, yeah, by all means, take you know, take my pick. We'll take back Martel Webster. We'll take back some of your junk, so we don't have to uh, at sixteen. But you know, two weeks before the draft, David Kahn and and I understand it's not a pick. I'm not really picking on Kahn because I think most general managers would do the same thing. Well, the sixteenth pick and the twenty third pick, I'm not going to give up all that stuff just to move up two spots in the draft. Uh, that's ridiculous. That's too high a, high a price to play, and not understanding yet how the draft's going to pan out, and there's probably not anybody worth your while there at 16-23, so just give those guys away. If Evan Turner's the guy you like, you just give him away and move up there. Uh, I do think that Philly decided that they thought Evan Turner was going to be a star. I agree with you. I would have I would have swapped the pick and taken whoever was there. Well, can we agree that cousins. we can agree that Turner Cousins favors? There's absolutely no way to know who's going to be the best out of those three. And odds are all of those three guys are going to be good picks unless you get Cousins in the wrong situation. I just feel like if you move down from two to four, you pick up some extra picks. You're yeah. moving down because the guy at four loves your number two spot. Right. You move to number four. You take Cousins. You also end up with the 16 and 23 picks, and you dump a salary on Minnesota. 
and you get a guy who might be better than the two guys before him anyway. And, I, and on top of that, this is going to sound weird, and I wish I thought of this last night when I was writing the column, but I kind of like DeMarcus Cousins in Philly because I feel like out of all the big cities, all the sports cities, they would kind of get him the most. They've rooted for guys like him before. Yeah, they got Iverson. Yeah, they got Iverson, they got Barkley, they get guys like that. They can they can extract the most out of somebody like that. I just think he would have been a good fit. I think Doug Collins would have helped him. Um, and I thought that was the home run pick for them. I don't think they should have taken him at two, but if you could trade down two spots and pick up a, a whole loot of stuff and still get him, it's pretty good. Yeah, uh, I... You know, I think this will be the, the debate. I, I, here's, how, here's how I rank these guys. Derek Favors has the highest ceiling of any of these guys. He also yes. is by far, I think, the one who could bust. Yep. Because he's, he's not there. We're all projecting what he could become. It's the Kwame syndrome, the, Kwame, the fear yeah. of Kwame 2.0. He, he's, he's Kwame 2.0, could be Darko 2.0. I mean, all of these bigs that historically have won the draft that everybody's excited about because of the physical tools and the size and whatever who haven't done it, he, he's that guy this year. Um, but people forget. They said, we'll never draft those guys. People forget Dwight Howard was that guy. Yep. Uh, two, Amari Stoudemire was that guy, um, you know, as well. And so you can't just say automatically they're going to be a bust. I actually think Favors going to be pretty good. Uh, Turner was the safest pick. I don't think, I think he had, he doesn't have the highest ceiling of those three, but he also, I have a hard time fathoming that Evan Turner's a bust in the league. No, he's. I would say that he's a sure thing as a borderline all star. Yeah, and 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 could be Brandon Roy type all star. Yeah, uh, and, possibly. Yeah, so yeah, he's got that little. He's got that little range between borderline all star and solid all star. And then Cousins. I, 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 I don't even know. We know what to do with Cousins. But, Cousins, the biggest ceiling in basement that we've had in a while. Yeah, has there been a bigger ceiling basement? I'm trying to think. No, well, no, I th- no, I don't think so. I think Favors has the bigger ceiling basement because I think even if DeMarcus Cousins is a head case, if he's Rasheed Wallace, if he's Derek Coleman, those guys, we're disappointed in those guys' careers yeah. because of what they could have been, but they also had pretty productive careers. Right. Derek Coleman on his worst day was, a, you know, even if he was hungover from 19... 19- glasses of crystal the night before was still going to get you 18 and 9 yeah and, and, and I, I just don't think there's any way Cousins doesn't do that now you, people are going to be groaning and you know all sorts of things and it's going to be a, a roller coaster ride with him maybe if he doesn't if he doesn't get the maturity thing but he's still going to produce it's just going to be he's going to be one of these guys that will always be somewhat of an enigma and we're always going to be like gosh he could be and may, maybe he'll get there uh, but I, I predict kind of a Rasheed Wallace type career for him. I think that's what's what, what's going to be. Yeah, and maybe maybe gets traded one time, even two times before he reaches what his destiny is as a player. I don't. I do not think that he will be a bust, and I don't think that it will ever be a situation that he's out of the league in four years and they're running outside the line stories on him and stuff like that. Only, only favors. Only favors has that risk of those groups. I think. Yeah, Cousins. Cousins is going to bounce around and people will take chances on him. That's the worst case scenario. Now, you put him with Evans, just on paper, perfect world, sky is blue. That's a freaking monster one too. I don't know if they could play together, and I don't know if I don't know if I'd want to play with either of them. But man, uh, it's it's uh, it's remarkable the transformation that Sacramento is under. I mean, after being the queens for so many years, they're this kind of edgy. Tough, um, not sure you're totally comfortable with the guys they got on their roster, but also I think teams are going to be scared to death to play them um, because they're they're going to be a really good team. Well, they have two guys that athletically and physically are are mismatches against whoever they go against right. meeting the other team. Like you're going to have these teams are like, oh crap, we play that we have to go to Sacramento tonight. I hope I hope Cousins doesn't play hard. You know that they. I just think. Uh, that team will have like eight or ten games next year where people would be like, whoa, did you see that? They beat the Lakers by 20. How did that happen? And then they'll, of course, lose five in a row. But um, I, I'm pretty intrigued by them. Last qu- last thing, and then we'll let you go because you got to uh, you got to rejuvenate, recharge, get ready for 2011. Say something to the fans of Portland that uh, talks them off the ledge. I don't I, Jump. <laughs> 
My, my, my advice to you is jump, because I think Paul Allen, we talked a little bit about this in the debate, yeah. has now entered the Donald Sterling zone. He's Al Davis. He's, he's crazy Al Davis. It's um, unbelievable. I, I, it, and, and here's the thing I'll say about Kevin Pritchard. If, if you're an owner and you're thinking about, eh, who should I hire for my next GM, take, take note of this. He was amazing as a general manager. The team throws him under the bus for months, leaves, leaves him dangling, leaks to the press all sorts of ridiculous uh, and derogatory stuff about him. He keeps doing his job. Yeah. doesn't say anything. It's... He now knows, he finally figures out, that I have no chance of keeping my job. He's working 20 hours a night, still preparing for the draft, knowing that they're going to fire him as soon as the draft's over. That's, that's what's going to happen. It's an hour before the draft. As you're getting ready to walk in the, to the war room, Paul Allen says, Hey, Kevin, can I talk to you for a second? Fires him an hour before the draft, but then says, Hey, uh, we'll still want you to run the draft room tonight. Yeah, and good guy. And Richard doesn't do what I would have done, which is when I got to the t- uh, when I got there, I would have picked up the phone, I would have started calling around and saying, "Listen, I'll give you Brandon Roy for your uh, 56 pick in the draft. Uh, with the 22nd pick in the draft, uh, we're going to take Omar Samhan, right? Which you would have loved, but I would have I would have enjoyed that pick. And hey, Joe uh, Mead, Joe Mead, yes, get the bleep button ready. Okay, I would have told Paul Allen, "Hey, Paul, go f- yourself. How about that? Go." F- yourself and that's and i would have walked out and that would have been the end of my portland gm rant so i applaud kevin pritchard a classy guy there's no way that they're going to find a a guy who 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 is as innovative and creative as he is it it was rc buford sam presti these guys are smart guys they're not stupid after they saw what happened to kevin pritchard they're really going to give up the great gigs they have in san antonio and oklahoma city and go to that mess I love that rumor that Presti was going to, oh, yeah, let me go work for Paul Allen, the guy who just <laughs> hung out Kevin Pritchard to drive for four months. That sounds awesome. Whoever takes that job is taking that job because I don't have anything else better yeah. that I can do. Where Meanwhile, Kevin Pritchard, whether it's this summer and we know the Suns' job's open and the Clippers' job's open and who knows, maybe a, uh, the Warriors' job may be open and who knows, maybe even a couple more when they find out Kevin Pritchard's uh, available uh, might be open. If it's not this summer... Next summer, he's the leading candidate, head of Danny Ferry, head of all these guys, and he gets the job he wants. And, and you know, with Donnie Walsh's contract coming up in New York, that could be the Knicks. Uh, it could be all sorts of, uh, could be all sorts of different uh, opportunities. He's going to come out fine. If I'm a Blazer fan, it's over. Yeah, if I were Kevin Pritchard, I'd do TV for a year. Handsome guy, articulate, he'd be good, an asset to any television show and whatever network. Banging out for a year, get a paycheck. And your price is going to be through the roof next year because I think people are going to realize that was really stupid. They just got rid of one of the top seven GMs. And not to like, you know, blow smoke up Pritchard's butt for, for 10 minutes because he did, you know, he, he whiffed on Oda Durant. That has to be mentioned. And I actually think if Paul Allen was going to legitimately fire this guy and at least come up with some sort of excuse that fans could be like, all right, I don't agree with him, but at least I get it. He should have played the Odin Durant card and been like, look, you, this guy messed up the biggest draft decision uh, that this team has had in 25 years, and I just can't look at him anymore. I don't think that would have been fair, but at least that's a legitimate reason. I don't even know what the reason was. I don't think anybody knows. I, I think we've all been waiting for the other shoe to drop, the, the kind of shady revelation. No, I I think the info that's out is pretty accurate. I I think they thought this guy was getting too much attention and publicity, and I think it rubbed it rubbed Allen and the people that run that that Vulcan, whatever the hell. I, I think they were like, "Who's this guy? Why do they? Why does everybody think he's a rock star? We, this was a team effort. This guy takes too much credit." And I actually don't think that he was a take too much credit guy. I no, never really fault. got that gist. It was, it was our fault for that. Uh, yeah. he, he never came up with the term "prick slap." Right. Uh, that, that was a media thing. Um, he, he never, uh, he, he didn't ask for, and, uh, you know, I was, I was close to Kevin, uh, over, over the last few years. I never once heard him try to taunt his record, uh, you know, taunt, and, you know, another team. Yeah. Uh, he, he never pushed that. He was always actually very complimentary. I knew who his scouts were. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of GMs who never have ever mentioned to me a name of anybody else who works in their organization. 
he constantly mentioned these guys, talked about them, talked about Nate McMillan. Well, geez, at the Sloan Conference, he brought like his entire staff with him. And was was proudly. I've only met Kevin twice. I thought he was a really nice guy. I don't. I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm friends with him or even acquaintances with him. But I was impressed that he was so proud to introduce his staff to everybody. I just thought he seemed like a genuine dude. He, he, he's a genuine dude. I do think he does occasionally come off as arrogant. He is competitive. He uh, should be arrogant. He he did a great job. But, I would be arrogant. Yeah, this is the thing. If if you're upset. That he's getting undue attention, that's one thing. But the reason the guy got so much attention was because he was doing a great job. And I think this is the thing. You wrote, a, wrote one of my favorite columns you've written is the one after there was no trades at the trade deadline and you did the No Balls Association. Yes. Kevin Pritchard had balls. Yeah. He and was also, not afraid. And that's why fans, not only just Blazer fans, but NBA fans appreciated him as a GM because he was not afraid. He didn't calculate at every step along the way, what is the move that I can make that will keep my job for an extra um, six months? It was always about doing what he thought was the best and most aggressive move, and I wish there was more GMs in the league like it. Yeah, it's a great point, and I also think you have to give him credit for being the first guy out of all of these guys to realize that they could use cap space not just to blow it on whoever the free agent du jour is, but as a strategy, as right. like a long-term strategy of I'm going to take a bad contract, pick up a pick. I'm going to buy a pick here and, and pick a guy in Europe who's not going to be ready for three years. He was doing things that we had never seen before. And uh, and you know what? Maybe it was a group effort, but that guy was in charge. And Odin Durant, although was he there for Martel Webster? Was that he, him? But no, you know, he, was not, he was not the gentleman. Yeah, that was John Nash. Uh, Okay, because that was bad. But I think Oda Duran is really the only uh, blemish on his uh, on his resume. Even the Camby trade last year that was a freaking heist. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna if you're an owner and you're gonna resent a GM who's getting too much unwarranted hype, I think you I think it's Daryl Morey would be the guy that I would fire. <laughs> I just think uh, you know he's That's got a nick. I think Daryl Morey, I think his head's, he's got a big head. He runs his own sports conference now. He's got a nickname. He's Dork Elvis. He's, he, I, I don't know. He's flying around. I, I would give him a little reality check. Yeah, Joe, I want that in the headline. F- uh, Simmons fired Daryl Morey. Uh, <laughs> as the, the headline. You, you want to make a prediction for 2011? You, you follow these guys at all? Um, draft? 2011 draft? No, tell me who the guy is to watch. Uh, Harrison Barnes. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, you'll see him in North Carolina. Uh, people compare his game to Kobe. He, he, he He's not Kobe personality-wise, which I, I think is a problem. Part of what makes Kobe Kobe is he's the Mamba. Uh, you know, he's a killer. And uh, I'm not, <laughs> Except I'm, in the fourth quarters of final games. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm not going to Celtics fan right now. Yeah, well, it's except for the 29% in the seven 2010 final games and the four for uh, 20 and three quarters. And, um, but go ahead. Yeah. Um, he... <laughs> He, he's 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 got a similar skill set, similar similar size, similar type of player on the court, and uh, you know he, he's he's number one. Here's here's the one thing I'll, I'll say about 2011. I, I've been doing this a long time. This is the first time in the history of me doing the draft that on the debut of our top 100, there was not one returning college player in the top 10, not one. Wow. Now, that shows you a couple of things. One, there was a massive drain of talent in this year's draft who left. Uh, two, the state of college basketball isn't so great that there isn't one guy who can crack the top ten uh, as, a returning, as a returning player. Well, didn't you predicted that, though, because you said with the lockout coming next summer, a lot of these guys were coming out now to get paid. And they came out now. And, and third, this is a pretty interesting high school class that's coming in. And, and I know you're going to love this, Bill, but actually... Uh, it's been a big time drought with international players over the last, mm. I'd say, three or four years. I know you've been you've been crestfallen. Uh, there, there's there's three three international guys who could go in the top ten in this year's draft. Uh, fourth, if you want to count Enos Cantor, who's from Turkey but is going to be playing his freshman year uh, at Kentucky. And who is the guy? Jan Jan Wesley. Yeah, Wesley. Yeah. He was supposed to be in this draft and backed out. You loved him. Uh, he by far, I think, has the most the most uh, potential because he's not one of these soft European big guys who faces the basket and shoot. He's actually a legitimate NBA athlete who has a great motor 
And uh, and if you watched him in the EuroLeague Final Four, it's pretty rare to see a 19-year-old, 20-year-old in Europe playing on a high-caliber team in the EuroLeague Final Four, which is very, very good competition, and having, uh, at least in the semifinals, a wow uh, game. He, he's, he's, he's a good prospect, probably top five pick. I was at a dinner like three months ago with Gail Goodrich, who does stuff for NBA TV, and he's big on the Euro scene. And a year ago, he was touting Brandon Jennings. And he was one of the few guys who was like, you no, know, this guy's going to be good. This guy's going to be a, a really good pro player. And so at the dinner, we were like, so who's the guy this year? And he said, Jan Wesley. Yeah. That he's like, that guy is not a typical Euro guy. No. He is a guy who gets his hands dirty and plays hard, and people are going to love him. So I, I kind of found him away. There's a couple, there's one guy who's got like a 25 letter name, right? Yeah. Let's just skip it. <laughs> what country is he from? Some of these guys what, what, is he from Lithuania? Yeah, no, the Lithuanian guys are tough, man. It, it's like, seriously, it's going to be the longest name ever, which reminds me, don't sleep on uh, on the clips. Might be Lauren Greek Baby Shack over, who's got like a 25-letter name. Uh, Sofa Shokanakalis. Yeah, they might be luring him over this summer. Hey, uh, you know, more power to them if they're going to, all that, all that cap space that they had saved for LeBron, if they're going to, uh, replace it with Big Baby, uh, uh Baby Shack, uh, Greek Baby Shack. You know, it's uh, funny. So he drafted in like 1996. <laughs> right. He's ready to come over. He's 38. Uh, <laughs> you know, what's funny is, uh, here's a little scoop for you, Chad. So that, that Luau Dang deal? Is this off the record? It's off the record, but okay. we're taping it, so it's on the podcast, so I guess you, it's you, on the you record. You can tell me, Bill, nobody will, nobody will hear. It's on the record. Okay. Well, yeah, some people will still be listening, maybe like three or four. But um, So the Clips really could have had Lil Dang, and they didn't have to give up the eighth pick. It was basically the Heinrich deal. Um, but I don't think they would have gotten the 17th pick. Is one of those here, take Lil Dang type of trades. Right. And Sterling is just adamant that he doesn't want to do any trades like that because he really genuinely thinks that in July he's going to sign LeBron James. Hey. And uh, in his entire basketball operations, his sales staff, his marketing staff, all of them are like, look, we can't go to season ticket holders and, and we can't try to sell season tickets by telling people that we're going to make a big run at LeBron James. People are going to laugh at us. He's like, no, we're going to get him. And that's the mentality in Clipper Nation right now. Well, uh, I, I can say, yeah, talking to them, I think that that's true. I, I think that they believe it. I think. You know, they have a 0.1% chance. He uh, believes it. I don't think anybody who works for him believes it. And, but I'm not sure at the end of the day, given Luo Bank's contract, that that was necessarily a bad move by the Clippers to pass on that. Not, yeah, I'd have to look at the contract. I mean, it's a trade that'll certainly be there in the middle of July. I would, you know, but I think it is the type of trade that they might have to think about because I don't think they're signing a free agent otherwise. The, the, the problem with a lot of these teams, and I, I know we're going on, on on back in free agency, but the problem with a lot of these teams, and, and Miami, Miami is going to have this problem. The Knicks are going to have this problem. The Clippers certainly. Clippers have five players under contract. I know. So, and then maybe now that you have their second round pick and in Bledsoe, maybe it goes up to you know, seven or something. Then um, they sign, they, and they have room for one player. They bring in that guy, they have to fill out the entire rest of their roster with minimum contracts. Now, if it was LeBron, okay, sure, I'll do it. If it's Lou Bang, I'm not sure that I want to so kill the depth of my team by bringing in Lou Bang. I think I start to piece out that money. But the Heat, I love this idea of LeBron and Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh playing there. And, and I, I, I honestly believe the Heat could do it. And I think the guys will seriously consider it. But you could be in a case of they could have one player under contract, Mario Chalmers. They could sign all three of those guys into their into their spots. They have four second round picks that they drafted, who are basically cap neutral because they're considered minimum contracts. And the yeah. NBA and collective bargaining agreement puts cap holds up to twelve players. And they would have to sign four more players at the minimum, and you would have LeBron James. Uh, Chris Bosch, uh, Dwayne Wade, Mario Chalmers, and the equivalent of eight second-round picks. But do you think, as, a, as, a, as the man who wrote the book of basketball, yes, and you talked about the secret, and it's I, brilliant. Know, it's brilliant. I love I love what they're trying to do. Do you do you think a team with LeBron, Wade, and Bosch 
and then their next best player is the 400th best player in the league. No, 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 because they'll have room to get like a Ray Allen, somebody like that. No, no, no. They'll have three no, and a half guys. No, they won't. Yeah, they will. The cap's like 56. The cap- or they'll trade Beasley for something. I think they'll end up with four guys. I will remind you that everybody said the same thing in 2008 when the Celtics were basically Allen, Pierce, Garnett, and these two kids that nobody knew anything about right. named Rajon Rondo and Kendrick Perkins. Right. Right. Now, they lucked out with those two, but it was a very similar thing of, well, how can they put it? And meanwhile, we got James Posey, we got Eddie House, we got P.J. Brown. Like yeah. These veterans want to play with good – they want to win a title. Those guys were on their roster. Pat Riley is get, get, ain't going to find Rajon Rondo no. in free agency or Kendrick Perkins in free agency at the minimum. I but he could Ron, find – uh, He Celtics could Ron. find the P.J. Brown, James Posey, Eddie House types. Yeah, he might. He might. Um, I'm not I sure think it's conceivable. Left, but. Well, wait a second though. How much? How much do you? Do you? Uh, the the rumor that's been two years old now. It's not like somebody created this a week ago. That these guys were all at the Olympics in China, and uh, and Chris Paul, LeBron, Wade, and Bosch all said, "Let's play together." And Joe Johnson, who's like kind of the fifth Beatle in this whole thing, he's like <laughs> the Peter Lawford or Joey Bishop of this group, but. All those guys are like, yeah, let's play together in summer 2010. All right, let's take a let's take a blood pack, cut your finger. If they did one of those type of deals, do you think that actually happened? I don't think it happened. Okay. I I I, I mean I, I don't want to impunge whoever reported. I don't know I don't know who reported it, but I have a hard time believing it. And if they if they did say it, I don't think they understood the realities of the collective bargaining agreement and the fact that each of those guys to do something like that would have to leave some serious money on the table. Um, to do it, and that I guess is that's a deal breaker. That's when you take that blood and try to stuff it back in the cut. Uh, when you find out this is going to cost me five million a year. Uh, Agree or disagree that um, this has all been decided already? Disagree. You don't think that heading into July first, all of these guys know what they're going to do? I think I think they all have an idea, but I don't think they know. And I think the reason is LeBron. Um, I think I think Bosch knows he's leaving. I think Bosch is frankly waiting to see what LeBron does. I think Dwayne Wade knows he's staying and he's going to recruit hard. Uh, if not these guys, then you know Joe, the Joe Johnsons and Amari Stoudemire's or whoever. He's going to do that route. But I think LeBron is genuinely torn between leaving the city that has embraced him and that he grew up with and being loyal. And, and, and winning an NBA championship. I think he understands now that that's probably not going to happen in Cleveland, at least not anytime soon. Um, and which of those two are going to matter the most to him? Everything, everything that I hear from, I think, a credible source is that that is truly, he is truly conflicted about that. Until he signs with somebody else, then he won't be as conflicted. I think, he'll, I think, I think his head's going to win over his heart. I think it should. Uh, I think he ends up in Chicago with Bosch. I think they trade Leo Dang to Atlanta for Joe Johnson and put those three with Derrick Rose and Joakim Noah, and the NBA is over until 2020. I, 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 I think that – I'm not sure about the Joe Johnson thing. I do think uh, – I've been saying this for a while, and uh, I wish I could talk about the particular source that I have, but I, I think of all the people I've talked to is the most credible um, who believes that's exactly what's going to happen, and that LeBron, despite all the stuff about playing in Michael Jordan's shadow – LeBron is actually so intrigued with Jordan that to kind of live out his life, like, you know, here's just an anecdote that I found so interesting, is that, you know, Jordan, after games in Chicago, would go down to Gibson Steakhouse on, 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 on Rush Street, and he had a particular table that he would sit in the back, and he would smoke cigars, and he would eat, and he had his own waiter and everything else. He had that table. When LeBron heard that story, when he's in Chicago, he goes to Gibson, sits at the same table, mm. um, has the same waiter. Um, and uh, uh, when I was um, sitting at Gibson's uh, during the, the Chicago uh, draft camp, I can tell you this part about it. I, when I was sitting in the draft camp uh, in Chicago, I went to Gibson's. And I'd heard this theory from, I think, a pretty good source. And so I started asking her, I said, who's Michael Jordan's waiter? And I found him. And I came and asked him, what do you think? Because this guy apparently was a confidant to Jordan. Jordan knew him well. He, uh, there's this one guy that Jordan was connected. I said, what do you think about LeBron? He's come to Chicago. He said, he's come to Chicago. He already told me to reserve his table. So a 
later is going to scoop the story. Wow. LeBron to Chicago. Now, I don't, I don't actually think what, LeBron here's, decided, but I just think it's a fun story. Well, I agree with you, and also... Um, the the one argument that people have against him going to Chicago is that oh why would he want to play in Jordan Shadow? Um what the hell did Kobe just do with Magic? Right. You know, it's like these guys, if anything, they like the Shadow. They want to continue like a legacy, they feel a kinship to it. It's I don't buy the whole oh he wants his own thing and start his own thing. These guys don't care about that. And if anything, we know that LeBron who wore number 23 his entire career was a gigantic Michael Jordan fan. So I don't think that's going to dissuade him from uh, signing I that. Think, I think people who are saying that have no idea, no idea who this guy is. Uh, right. I, I, think that, I think it's almost a bonus. Yes. Not, not, not a detriment that the Bulls were, were Michael Jordan's team. I think that he would get a rush from, you know, uh, no, and being the last guy introduced. I, 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 think that, I think that's a bonus for him, not a negative. And he's close to home. Yeah, uh, it, it, he's he's close to home, and as long as he feels like he's not going to get shot the first time he goes into Akron after leaving the Cavs, right. I, I think he does it. Um, I, I do think the guy doesn't want to be in such a place that he can't return home to Akron um, without being harassed or people, you know, uh, being really upset. Because I think that's a, I actually do think it's important to him. And if you listen to him carefully, the last time he spoke, he talked about his loyalty not to Cleveland. But the Akron. Right. And I think... I thought that was a message. If if this does go down that way, um, the way that his team handles the information that they disperse in the next couple of weeks after he signs will be the key. Because I think he could really hard hardcore play the whole, listen, I wanted to stay. They effed up the team around me. And I was playing. I have never played with an all-star. Don't count Mo Williams because we all know he's not an all-star. He's a, he was a LeBron all-star. Yeah. I, I carried those guys day in and day out for seven years. Every trade they made was terrible. The only draft, good draft pick they ever made was Verizal. And you know what? I'm 25 years old and I want to win a title. And I think I served my time. And if you want to blame somebody, blame the owner, blame Danny Ferry, blame uh, Jim Paxson. For giving away at number one for Yuri Welsh and all the dumb things he did, like that—that that is, those are the reasons that I'm leaving. Not because I don't like Cleveland, and not because I don't care about Akron. And I think that could be dispersed in the type of way that would at least make people go, "All right, you know, I don't like it, but I get it." And this is why I think the Bulls are the only credible destination for. Yeah, them. Miami because is a it, slap in the face. It, it, well, it, Miami, maybe if it's with Bosch and Wade, I mean, he can also sell that. But if he goes to New York to play with Danilo Gallinari right. uh, and, and the group, he's saying, I want to be in New York. I yeah. want the big lights, the big city. It's about the marketing. It's about the global brand. And you can't credibly sit in the press conference and then look uh, Cavs fans and broken-hearted Akron fans in the eye and say, this is really about winning, and the Cavs screwing it up. But you can legitimately say that, and I think any NBA fan will be hurt, but at a deep level will understand he's right. He's got a much better chance of winning in Chicago than he does in Cleveland. I mean, Jesus, look at that team he played with. Yeah. It's funny, like, you know, you look at how Kobe played, not just in Game 7, but that whole finals, and, you know, I, I he was okay. I, I don't think for him he was definitely subpar, but um, I think he certainly had the type of games that Dwayne Wade, can we agree, could have replicated at the worst. Yeah. Um, but they could survive an off game with him. Imagine Cleveland at home trying to win a game seven, this 2010 Cavaliers team, if LeBron James went six for 24. Not a chance. They lose by 30. So that is what he doesn't have. He doesn't have the luxury of, I can't be good tonight and we still might win. Yeah. And then if Kobe Bryant wants to keep the LeBron rivalry going, uh, and that he's he's really better than LeBron James, then he can ask the Lakers to trade him to Cavs, and then he can show LeBron he can take that team uh, to the finals with a six for twenty four shooting. And if uh, and if he did that, I would love him forever because that would be the ballsiest move. <laughs> can you imagine? Oh, watch this! I'm going to win with the team that you just left. <laughs> that, that that would be a story right there. That would lead Sports Center. All right, Chad Ford. Uh, enjoy the summer. Thanks for all the time, and uh, and we'll we'll argue about stuff over Twitter. All right, buddy. Take care. Take care. Target the center.
Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.